Hi everyone, Chris Fenimore here in the Test Kitchen. You know, every year around this time, the wonderful folks at Woolies Fish Market invite me to come down to their store on Penn Avenue in the Strip District and demonstrate a fish dish that people might want to add if they're going to be celebrating the Feast of the Seven Fishes. Well, this year we just we, we couldn't do it. So what we're going to do is try to do it remotely. <laughs> and uh, so what I have for you now is a recipe that I love to make and always make on Christmas Eve. It is uh, the bacala with uh, tomato sauce and olives and wonderful spices and whatnot. So I hope you'll enjoy it. And thanks again to those folks at Woolies. At the end of this little demo, we're going to have some uh, tips from some of the Woolies folks. I've made this before. But um, I have to tell you that uh, it, it is the, the, the aroma of, um, of rotting fish that, uh, <laughs> that, that permeates my childhood memory of this, of this day. Um, this is bacala. Um, it, it, uh, to say it looks inedible is to be kind to it. Um, they take cod and they dry it out in salt. And then, uh, actually, this is quite pliable. The one that my grandmother used to get um, uh, back in the day in Brooklyn uh, were hard as a board and I always thought how strange to be able to turn an ironing board into something to eat uh, and she did that by soaking this for several days in the basement with continuous changes of water there was water running and and she had to keep going down there and pouring it out and starting and to reconstitute this into something like fish but uh, um, I have to tell you even after that all of that was done it still tasted pretty salty and, uh, and, and whatnot. So I make this very traditional Sicilian uh, Christmas Eve dish with fresh cod. And if you look at this, now this looks edible. This is a nice big thick cod filet. Um, and they cut it for me so I had just the nice thick pieces. And this dish is really, uh, it's a sort of a quick sauce with potatoes and cod. Now people prepare the bacala, the dried salted codfish, in lots of ways. And we have lots of recipes in the, in the cookbook that talk about you know, the fried bacala. There's a bacala salad, a cold salad, which we will um, make a recipe something like that a little bit later on. But again, the bacala with the potatoes and this uh, very spicy uh, sauce is something that resonates with my childhood in which so many people who sent us their story said, this is what they remember, the bacala. So we're going we're gonna to start. We have a pan that's heating up here. I'm going to crank it just a little bit more because you actually make this sauce in a, in, a, in a large saucepan on top of the stove and then this dish finishes in the oven and uh, it takes about 30 minutes to prepare and then about another 30 minutes in the oven to cook. So it's not that difficult. There's a little bit of prep time. This is a nice big um, sweet onion that I'm using. Um, I just like the way that it caramelizes when you cook it. And I'm just going to cut it into thin slices. I'm not going to dice it. And I'm going to put this in here. And again, this is television cooking. So, <laughs> you know, we, we speed things up. We slow things down. On, on Christmas Eve, my grandmother would, would, well, actually, she started preparing all the dishes for um, the Feast of the Seven Fishes uh, for Christmas Eve, probably, uh, well, about four days ahead of time when she first got the cod and started soaking it. And, um, and the other dishes that we would make um, and that she would make. So it's a, it was a long labor of love. And that was another thing that came through in so many of the calls that we, and letters that we got from folks talking about this. Um, and that is that um, the Christmas Eve is at the end of the season before Christmas, which is called Advent in the Catholic Church. And it means the waiting, the anticipation. And it is the anticipation of the birth of a baby. And um, so it was always, in, in a big Italian family, somebody was always expecting a baby. I, I can't remember a time when I was growing up that one of my cousins wasn't expecting, or, you know, or, or my mother, uh, for, for that matter. I have uh, two brothers who are 10 years uh, younger than I am. So for many years, we, you know, we had a new baby in the house. And there is something so wonderful about the anticipation of a new baby, the thought about what they will become, what will happen to them, what will they, what joys will they have, what joys will they bring us, what kind of things will they face in the world, and what will they give to the world. And so um, 
that's all part of that anticipatory uh, gathering uh, and the kinds of things that we would talk about. And it was always a gathering of family. So there's, there's a whole lot of tradition in this Vigilia thing. Vigilia just means the, the, the eve of. And um, so it stands for the eve of Christmas. All right, I want to get this onion going. And I would get that um, to the point where it was nice and caramelized, actually, probably about 10 minutes worth of cooking. And in the meantime, I'm going to, uh, <laughs> you know, this is one of those things that my grandmother probably didn't do, but which I do now. Um, I peel celery. It makes it much more tender, especially if you're going to use it in a salad. Um, since this is going to be cooked in a pan and in the oven, it probably doesn't make much difference. But it, it takes some of the stringiness out of it, makes it cook nice and tender. Oops, the long long celery. Okay. And then I'm just going to chop it up into a... There's something wonderfully rustic about this dish, and, and you can imagine that the, that the taste of this dish brings people back and connects them with their ancestors who in Italy, probably, relied on the dried salted cod to get them through the winter. I mean, they could catch a lot of fish during the rest of the year, but in the wintertime, they had to rely on this dried salted cod. All right. So it was not just a, you know, a treat, it was a necessity, but so many of those things become the favored dishes now because they remind us of things. Okay, so now this is going to saute a little bit, and then I'm going to add some garlic. And I never add the garlic at, at first because the garlic burns if you put it in too soon. Um, my grandmother didn't cook with a whole lot of garlic, and I do. <laughs> but for this dish, and because we're celebrating our ancestors and the way they did things and why they did them, I'm just going to put two cloves of garlic in and I'm going to put them in whole so I can sort of fish them out. They'll add the flavor to this sauce, but they won't, um, you know, we won't have to worry about biting into huge chunks of garlic. Now, I just want to mention that I have parboiled some potatoes. Um, the first time I made this dish, my grandmother neglected to tell me that she pre-cooked the potatoes. I mean, who knew? Um, and so I, I made this dish and uh, just peeled potatoes and put it in and put it in the oven and when it came out they were like crunchy potatoes so I've learned that what you do is and I and I parboil them in their skins and what that seems to do is to make sure that they hold together a little bit better they uh, the texture of them is a little bit better and I'm using the Yukon gold potatoes which we never had access to but now I love them because they have a nice um, they hold together they don't crumble like the Idaho potatoes do I want to make sure I don't overdo this Okay. Okay. Now the next thing I have to add to this um, is some uh, Italian plum tomatoes. We're going to make a big batch, so I'm going to add this rather large can. I think the recipe calls for about 28 uh, 28 ounce can. These are beautiful San Marzano tomatoes that come from the San Marzano region um, near Naples, and um, they actually have a little basil packed in with them. But, and I'm not going to crush them um, through a mill or anything like that. I, again, like the rustic nature of this dish. So I'm just going to cut them up with the back of the spoon. And I'll tell you, these tomatoes are so tender that they break right apart. Uh, sometimes you'll get canned tomatoes that, you know, they, they're pretty hefty. They're a little bit difficult to, uh, to break down. But these will break right up as this. Uh, as that cooks, okay. And now we're going to flavor the sauce. Um, one of the things, uh, uh, of course, a little salt and pepper, a little bit of salt, my wacky pepper mill. And, um, and this was one of my early jobs. You know, people say, where did you start cooking in the kitchen? My grandmother would give me little jobs. And one of my little jobs was to um, take the, the, uh, olives and get the pit out. I've done some already. 
And then we would, we would chew on the pits um, just because they had a little bit of, whoops, a little bit of the olive. And this is a great job. Don't, don't let your kid use a knife to do this, but um, if they use a coffee cup, that's really good. A coffee mug is a terrific way to do this. All right. Now we got enough. Now these happen to have quite a bit, these are seasoned uh, cracked green olives, and they have a lot of seasoning in them already. Um, otherwise, I might put some uh, crushed red pepper into this recipe. But uh, if you get plain uh, olives, then certainly I would say season it up. But these are seasoned olives, so I can cut back on that. Oh, that's starting to look good. All right. And the last thing, um, well, not the last thing. Um, I've got to put in some fresh basil, just a little bit of fresh basil that I'm going to make a chiffonade, which is a fancy word for rolling it up and cutting it very thinly. And put the fresh basil not for anything except that the smell is unbelievable when you get a waft of that um, basil hitting the hot sauce. Everybody will be coming in the kitchen and going, what is that? Now we used to, we used to have this meal every Christmas Eve um, and we kids couldn't wait for it to be over. Um, we just wanted to grab something to eat, not the bacala. And, uh, and then get, get back to our playing or whatever we were doing. Well, of course, we had to go to church. We used to go to midnight mass. So, uh, okay, so that's in there. Now, this is, should cook down for about 15 to 20 minutes. Oh, I got to put a little bit of sugar in here. This is one of my grandmother's things. She says, oh, yeah, we always put a little bit of sugar in the sauce to make it sweet. Um, and now I'm going to take the cod. If this were reconstituted cod, it would be the, the bacala. But this is nice, fresh cod. And I'm going to cut it into nice, big chunks. And again, this would have cooked for about 15 minutes on top of the stove. I'm going to put the nice cod pieces in there. Oh, this is such nice, big, thick pieces. They're beautiful. All right. Put those in there. My father. <laughs> His favorite part of this whole thing, however, was not the cod. Well, maybe none, nobody liked the cod. I don't know. Maybe it was just one, one of those things. Um, his favorite thing was the potatoes. So he didn't care if all the fish got eaten up um, as long as there were enough potatoes. So I've, I've made uh, almost three pounds of potatoes here to put in this dish, which is way more than the recipe would call for, in honor of my dad, so that uh, if he were here, he would say, oh, yeah, we got it. Okay, I'm going to put this in here, some nice big chunks and slices. Now, you have a couple of choices. You could just put a lid on this and cook it on top of the stove for about another 20 or 30 minutes until the fish is cooked through. But I have put a batch in the oven and let it cook for that 20 or 30 minutes. And I'm going to bring that out right now, show you what it looks like when it finishes. Oh, yeah. Now, I have to also tell you, this is the same pan that my mother and grandmother used to make this dish. It's an old guardian. I don't think they make it anymore. It was a, uh, uh, a cast aluminum pan uh, that we had so many meals out of. And now, I'm going to just put a little bit in here. You'll see that potatoes are nice and tender. Some great, beautiful chunks. I want some of those olives because I like to have the olives. And there you have fresh cod bacala. <laughs> And we have the Alaskan salmons, uh, sockeye and king. Uh, and then we have the farm-raised salmon. Uh, they're both delicious and they're both wholesome. Yeah. 
But w when you say uh, the difference between, the, so there's wild caught and then there's farm raised in salmon, right? Correct. The wild caught is uh, primarily from uh, Alaska, uh, Seattle, Washington, and uh, the farm raised is in the fjords of Norway or Scotland, mm -hmm. uh, also Canada. Uh, very pristine waters. Uh, it's just a mouter fish, and it's uh, it's something we sell every day. Which one has the higher fat content? Because one of the things about salmon is the omega fatty three acids, Correct. which are so good for us. Correct. And that's why people have been eating more and more salmon, but it looks like some of them are a little fattier than others. Right. Uh, the, the best source is the wild caught Alaskan for the omega three fatty acids. And the sardines, which is also frozen right here, These have a very high content of omega-3 fatty acids, the, uh, the sardines. Yeah, people don't uh, eat whole sardines, do they? they as much as they could, they Becoming very should. popular. Well, because people, popular. people always say sardines are fishy tasting. That's but, correct. But they are fish. That's <laughs> correct. But uh, what they're, they're grilling these, mm -hmm. and they're delicious. Yeah. I've eaten them many times. Uh, just a terrific fish. Yeah. Uh, from Portugal. Uh, excellent source of omega-3 fatty acid. Well, that brings up a point that I wanted to, to get to, and that is the difference between fresh fish and frozen fish, because you sell a lot of, and people buy, a lot of frozen fish, but Correct. sometimes that's a good thing to buy. That is a good thing to buy. Uh, that's because it's caught right on board, frozen right on board, and or taken back to the filet house on the same day. Uh, like, for example. I know you have a big supply of uh, frozen cod and tilapia Correct, back that's there. all caught and frozen and processed on board. Most of the shrimp that people eat is frozen and then uh, defrosted in the market where it's sold, right? Correct, all of the shrimp is frozen on board IQF frozen or brought back to the shrimp house and put on the conveyor belt, cleaned and put on the conveyor belt, individually quick frozen. Right. Makes for a, a terrific product, wild caught, shell on, ready to cook in a hundred different recipes and it's, it's a great product. Yeah, so frozen doesn't necessarily mean, you know, bad because um, you, it, it's better to have a, a, frozen a, a something that's frozen at the source than to get a piece of fish that's been traveling around for three weeks until it gets to you. Correct. Yeah. And that's important. Now the other term that's used is um, line, line, line caught. caught. Yeah, line caught, uh, meaning each fish is caught one at a time. Very sustainable method of fishing uh, versus a Persian which uh, is like a, a big net that brings up everything. It's uh, destructive to other species that weren't intended to be caught. Uh, so sustainable and line caught go together. So those are the things that you look for when you want to buy fish that they're correct. listed as sustainable or correct. line caught. That is correct. All of these fish on the counter are line caught. So we try to work with the fisheries to make sure that we are selling sustainable seafood. Right. Well, it only For makes example, sense. This in swordfish here was line caught and not uh -huh. net caught. Those black bass are line caught. The red snapper, the yellow pike, the grouper, uh, all line caught. There are a whole new set of terms that people use related to uh, to the fish that they buy. One is that it says sustainable. What does sustainable fish mean? Sustainable fish means uh, the 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 fishery, the biomass in the ocean, is is sustained after the catch. Meaning, 
in a year's time when the season reopens, you can go back and catch more from a vibrant, vibrant fish stock. Right. Uh, the the species is surviving and reproducing, and is uh, left mostly intact. You're not you're not you're not taking all the fish out of the ocean. So a, a sustainable fishery would be like the Alaskan fishery, or the Maine lobster, or the. That's two that come to mind. Yeah, so there, there are rules in place to make sure that areas are not overfished and just, you know, just... Uh, Excellent work, Chris. Not overfished. Uh, there's a season, there's a starting date, and there's an ending date, and they take so much fish and they leave the rest to repopulate. Hi, fish.